Go, Melon. <laughs> Episode 87. Man, we 87. are back. 87. We're back with another episode of the Cinnamon, the Tasty Toast of Mr. Douglas Davidson and myself. Seed Man, it's been a couple weeks since uh since we recorded one man so we are back to bless your eardrums with more <laughs> film talk and talk goodness uh mr davidson how are you doing today sir i'm doing all right i'm doing all right seen a lot of movies lately so you know doing pretty good, doing pretty that's, good. that's what i like to hear that's what i like to hear um we are deepish into the summer blockbuster season so i mean it's it's had about a month we, yeah. we had what guardians to kick that off and then since then we've had uh flashes hit um indiana's about to hit and yeah, new picks are joining uh, us out there for the littles yes, so you've yes seen i have seen it uh let's see extraction two hit uh two 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 i'm sure there's been some others that's what i was thinking and uh there's other things out there as well um uh, uh flashes hit as well i'm not sure you said that already or not uh yeah yeah so so yeah, there's there's movies out there. Oh yeah, we are, we are we're giant popcorn season. But not only that, what's really great is some of the films. If you missed them in the fall or spring, some of those are starting to hit either home video or streaming services. I for one am super stoked that it appears that Focus Features has worked out a deal with Peacock, so that a lot of their films are jumping to Peacock for streaming availability. So there's a few on there that I, I'm glad I have a subscription because I've been wanting to see Polite Society since it premiered at Sundance. Mm-hmm. And it's finally streaming, so I will be watching it when I get some free time. There you go. You'll be watching that sometime in November then. No, uh, no. July, I'm taking a vacation. That's right. That's I will right. not be writing for like a week and a half. It's um, going to be weird. Almost two weeks. I like it. Uh, Me too. I haven't done it in over a year. I I'm uh, tired. I no longer fuck with focus features when I realize that the O in focus in their logo is out of focus. Uh, I will no longer represent focus features until they change that logo to a more focus focus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, man, let's get down to get down. What have you seen recently? Uh, I've seen quite a bit recently, particularly because I've been covering the Tribeca Film Festival remotely, uh, myself and one of my contributors, uh, Justin Waldman. Uh, the two of us have been sort of tag teaming a bunch of different things. I, by, If things go well, tomorrow night will be my 10th film that I'll be covering. All that coverage is available on the Elements of Madness website. But the two that I wanted to mention... Uh, one, because there's a lot of folks that are View Askew uh, fans. Sav Rogers did a documentary called Chasing Chasing Amy. It premiered at Tribeca. It is about Sav as a young person when they were 12, were struggling with their sexuality and a number of other things. And you can go check out the TED Talk. It's I've it's, a good bit of it is is featured in the documentary. But talks about how, as a young person, they uh, <laughs> went. They held their own Ben Affleck mar- movie marathon. <laughs> it was just watching all as one of these does. Ben Affleck movies, as one does, and just so happened to stumble upon Chasing Amy. Watched it and absolutely loved it, and says that this is a movie that legitimately saved their life when they were being bullied for their sexuality and a number of other things. Sav found solace in this film. And now as a filmmaker, Sav decided to go to the places where Chasing Amy took place and do interviews with the cast, the crew, Kevin Smith, of course, and explore the movie. And through that, really sort of confronted the way that the movie's perceived. Certainly, it it very much has its problems, not just the fact that it's a uh film in the lgbtqia plus community as told from a cis white dude's perspective so there's some issues there and when you find out where the story came from not just from kevin smith and joey lauren adams relationship but also scott mosher's relationship with uh, uh genevieve turner it's really kind of fascinating and it adds some depth to it. But then there's also 
I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. Uh, there's also the way that the film impacts the cast itself. It is complex. It is very personal. And where it starts off as an exploration of chasing Amy, uh, it's a really interesting exploration into Sav themselves. So if you are a fan of the of chasing Amy, if you're a fan of Kevin Smith, I recommend checking this out, if only for the way that it tells its story. Hmm. Another film that came out of Tribeca that I absolutely want to recommend is a film called The Future by, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, Noam Kaplan. The premise is it's sort of an alt present that takes place in Israel, and a Palestinian woman has shot the um, tourism and space travel boss. Good. So, like, I forget what the title is of that individual. But think of it like a secretary of and assassinates them. And this woman has developed an algorithm that predicts terrorist attacks using past events and studying people's online communication, studying biometrics, studying all these things to prevent incidents from happening. And it didn't prevent this. So these two women sit down to have a conversation about this. And between these two conversations, there's also finding out about the scientist who developed the program, who's doing the interviewing about what's going on in her life and how all of these things sort of swirl together to really demonstrate that when it comes to the lives of Israelites and Palestinians, things are a lot more complicated than either side really wants to admit. Um, and certainly that the Israelis who have not only taken over segments of Palestine, but have continued to create more of an apartheid state, uh, then the Israelites have a bigger responsibility to face that. Mm -hmm. So it is politically charged, but it's not, it, it's, it's not, it's text, but not in your face text. It's using these other relationships to explore this stuff. And I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, on a lighter note, I caught up with Air, directed by Ben Affleck. I was fucking shocked. I think I'm turning into a dad. Because, oh, because I know my two kids didn't do it. This fucking movie did. <laughs> because I was like, you know what? I've heard it's sort of breezy and fun. Um, I can watch it while I'm um, taking care of some laundry. And I kept stopping and just standing in front of the TV. <laughs> yeah. Arms crossed, mm -hmm. dad pose, yep. and just sandals like, on. Just sucked into it. Uh it it I I I really did love how it was executed. It's got some great energy, a few for me, too many needle drops, but I loved the approach of it. I loved how and it was smart, I thought, to really minimize the Michael Jordan of it all and just focus on the development of the shoe and everything else. But what was strange about it is that I had to watch it in parts and I kept wanting to go back to watch it. Like I had to watch something that night and I was like, how do I get through that faster so I can see how this movie ends? Uh, so it's streaming on Prime Video right now after having a brief time in theaters did did you see it i forget no um didn't really care about the story yeah i don't either but it's so fucking well done that i couldn't help it there you go so i would recommend it even if you don't care about the story i mean shit i don't i've never owned a pair of jordans i did own a, a chicago bulls t-shirt once because That's i was rooting thing. for the dream team so i wore that to summer camp Oh, there you go. Uh, when when you know, so there was a couple. There was there was like a week or two where I was into basketball, and then after that, I went, "Oh yeah, right. I'm a short Jewish kid. What the fuck am I doing?" So, <laughs> but I would recommend Air. It is a good bit of fun. And then last but not least, streaming on Netflix, Sam Hargrave returns to direct Tyler Rake in Extraction Two. He doesn't that even direct Chris Chris Hemsworth. He directs no, Tyler. Chris Rake. Hemsworth. It's Tyler Rake. <laughs> Okay. No, this uh, I, it's well, it's weird. It. I I rated one higher than two because of the, the the structure of the story, but I would sit down and rewatch two. Absolutely, two takes place roughly nine months since the end of one. 
and Tyler gets approached to do another extraction job, but this time it's more personal. And in this film, when we say this time it's personal, no, it really fucking is. It's it's it, he is forced to confront uh, the specters of his past in a very real and unfortunately violent way. I dug the shit out of this. The 20 minute false warner is absolutely fantastic. There's pr- plenty of moments to get your to catch your breath before the shift changes in location. They found clever ways to to continually amplify things in each of the locations. There are at least two to three more set pieces af- action set pieces after that and each one has some fucking balls out amazing moments. It is, as of right now, pretty close to having some of my favorite action scenes of the year. And go. I watched John Wick on Saturday. I'm about to say, are you not going to talk about the best action movie of the year, John Wick? So, I enjoyed it. I had some problems with it because they done some of this stuff already. Yes, he has shot many people before. Yeah, but I mean, like, the way that they've done it. So, John Wick 4, there's this big action sequence towards the end that's fucking exhausting. And to a point, I was like, oh, thank God they have John Wick looking exhausted after he gets kicked the fuck back down the steps. I was Uh, like, God damn it, he has to fight back up those steps? No, I'm so tired, please stop. The audible gasp in the theater. I bet that was amazing. When he got kicked down the stairs, is like, oh, no. And then Homer says, don't, don't, don't. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> just, just keeps going. I mean, it's it's a wonderful moment, particularly to have have Kane show up. I imagine that too. Seeing that reveal, just people responded with "fuck yes. yes," and you get the two of them fighting side by side, which is wonderful. But here's my thing: great theater. Uh, chapter two, uh, cannon fodder was sent after John Wick when uh, Santino throws the uh, contract up. He goes through the cannon fodder. Chapter three. There's a whole sequence involving cannon fodder at the beginning of the movie. He cuts through those fuckers, too. How many times are any members of the high table going to go, you know what? We're just going to send cannon fodder after John Wick. That'll that'll get rid of him. I mean, sure, it tires him out. Maybe somebody gets lucky. But where he was headed at the end of that movie, it's not like he needed full on energy for. It's John Wick. He's got a gun. He could be fucking asleep. He's still going to shoot you dead. <laughs> so uh, I'm I the bad guy. Love... I'm definitely going to wear his ass out before it's time for me to fight him. That's just good villainous. Yeah, but if you're going like head to head swords, it's a fucking pistol duel. Mm-hmm. And and one detail that I did love is when he the second shot with Donnie Yen hits him sort of like in the side. Mm-hmm. I bet it's in the same spot he shot the doctor. At the, in, at the beginning second, of chapter three, three knows yeah. exactly knows exactly where to fire in order not to hurt him. It's intentional. I fucking love those those details. There's so many great details. The Lawrence of Arabia shit was fucking hilarious. Just, but I mean, he had why why set the fire? What was the point of that fire other than to like put Daredevil initials on fire <laughs> in front of John Wick? <laughs> The entire reason was just to have Lawrence Fishburne blow out blow out the match. Hell yeah. But but there were some little things about it that and I think the biggest thing for me that had me reduce my excitement is I knew that there was a chapter five coming. Mm. And that ending is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I pick your interpretation of how it goes. I love the I quite it's so fucking good and satisfying. And you've got these four chapters where he is literally fighting through heaven and hell to get his freedom again. And you give him a chapter five? Fuck you. Yeah. He he would be of service. He has served. Fuck off. <laughs> it's just it's, so it kind of bugged me in the sense of 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 if I'd been in the theater and I'd seen that, I can't imagine what the response was. But but seeing that and going, oh, shit, this this is the end of the story. Oh, cool. This is satisfying. And then you find out there's a fifth one. Motherfucker. <laughs> like, <laughs> literally or metaphorically, don't dig his ass up. Let him be. Let him retire. Twice he's done the impossible <laughs> to, to retire. But anyway, so um, 
I really liked Extraction 2. I did really like John Wick. There was some wonderful uh, sort of Sammo hung Golden Harvest physical comedy in there. That yeah, was really wonderful. there's some good physical comedy in there. Uh, I I watching the bonus features. I loved how Killa Harkin was was actually designed after Sammo Hung in Enter the Dragon, mm-hmm. which I thought was wonderful. Which made me go back and find the sequence because when I watched Enter the Dragon over a decade ago, I didn't know who Sammo Hung was. So I watched and I was like, "Oh shit!" I wouldn't have recognized him even now. Yeah, but but anyway, so did did like don't don't mistake this. Did like uh, John Wick Four. I just. I kept feeling like we've we've seen some of this, like they've done some of these things. Plus, okay, this is going to be nitpicky as shit. And I know it feel free to attack me for it. And then I promise I'm done with all of this. So the car sequence. One, I could tell that it was CG to all to hell. Like I could I could see the seams and it bothered me. But when he gets in the car and does those amazing stunts, and let me tell you, they're fucking amazing. My brain went, all right, I know enough about action movies to know. He didn't steal like a high table person's car. He didn't steal like an assassin like him dude's car. He stole cannon fodder's car. There's no fucking way cannon fodder has the funds for a tricked out ride that can pull that shit off. That's some bullshit. It's movie magic, but it's some bullshit. Yeah, like it ain't uh... fucking happening fast and furious i believe it because they'd have those tricked out rides to pull that shit off to a degree but john wick getting cannon fodder dude in paris france who's like i'm eating a beignet oh shit i gotta go kill john wick who's walking down the street for 40 million dollars no sir you do not have that vehicle that's the most Doug Davidson you've ever Doug Davidson on this podcast <laughs> before. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's one of those weird things that, you know, you get wrapped up in the movie and there were some moments where you just get wrapped up in it. The 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 fight sequence in Osaka is so fucking good. I love when Kane just starts putting th- putting the things on, on yeah, the, the sound wall. joints. I was like, what yeah. is he doing? What is he? Ding dong. Motherfucking yeah. <laughs> And the fact that that Wick is laying on the the glass, frozen, hangs right above him, and he knows he makes a sound. He's fucking dead, and that just the way that it hangs in the air. He sees the gun and he goes for it. He hears the glass and he's like, "Fuck me!" <laughs> There's some wonderful moments in this movie, uh, and plenty of action sequences that that certainly live up to what we expect for the previous ones. The bigger issue I had is it just it started to feel its length for me in some of the action sequences. They were just so long. And there's only so many ways you can flip over a dude, shoot him in the neck, shoot him three times to knock him over, shoot him in the neck. Like there was some redundancy, but uh, would watch again. Will watch again when I find a spare three hours. Well, there you go, man. There you go. In uh, November, I think you said. In November. <laughs> I will be surprised if you watch it again this year. Maybe we'll try to squeeze it in for uh, some awards consideration for cinematography when it comes time. For uh, awards consideration is, for cinematography. It is for beautiful. Cinematography. It is beautiful. The, for cinematography. The scene, yes. <laughs> when he, when uh, Winston and uh, Sharon are walking into the Marquis's office and you meet the Marquis for the first time, it's just beautiful. That long ass walk he does all the way down that hall, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, man. There's a whole lot of photography that are just beautiful. <laughs> that are just beautiful. They are. Anyway, so I went on for way too long. What have you been watching? I'll make mine quick. I watched Spider Man Cross Spider Verse because that shit is dope as fuck. Uh, we all know it's dope as fuck. All you've heard on the internet is how dope as fuck it is because it's dope as fuck, and there's no need to belabor the point of how fucking dope this movie is. Uh, they have taken what we got into. They have elevated the stakes and across um they have left it on such a batshit wonky cliffhanger that was so well executed um i cannot wait to see how you end this trilogy um and just to see how 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 does miles unfuck himself from the position that he currently finds himself uh i'm a teenager does he want to get unfucked (laughs) right (laughs) 
I'm glad his mom got a little bit more shine in this movie because she didn't have that much to do in the first. Uh, Awkward Pops, transition, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> Pops took a little bit of a backseat in this one because he's prominent enough in the first movie, so you got a little bit of a parental shift, but um, maybe some of cinema's uh, better recent parents, I would say. It's uh, it's it's crazy to see Oscar Isaac pull off yet another pop culture figure. Um, and it's weird seeing a spider as as a villain of a Spider-Man story, right? an antagonist of a Spider-Man story. It is a difference there. The spot is the villain. That's the only drawback for me is there's almost no attention, not enough attention paid to the villain. Once Miguel O'Hara is introduced, you forget that there is actually a villain to this movie because he just overpowers everything else from there. And it's kind of just Miles versus Miggy the rest of the way through. And it's like, oh yeah, we got to put a fucking... Uh, a little bit of spot in here to remind the audience who, who the fuck they're supposed to be fighting against, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 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 MCU phase one like imbalance between hero and villain and screen time and respect to given, but still, uh, fun as all get out. Uh, uh-huh. yeah, I also saw, of course, like you mentioned earlier, Indiana Jones and a Dial of Destiny. This movie is way too long, uh, uh-huh. but it is still uh, incredibly fun. You can shave a good. <laughs> 154 minutes, you can save a good 25 minutes off that joint uh, and make it a more lean, tight movie. Some of the action scenes go on a little too long, like you were saying in John Wick 4. Um, the opening action scene that gets you reestablished back in the world of Indiana Jones is pure Indiana Jones. Uh, it really starts off with a bang. Uh, and, and they gave Toby Jones one of, if not my favorite line, in a movie this year, uh, what was I supposed to do? Hide while my friend runs into danger? I was like, oh, that's that's a good line right there. Um, the dynamic between Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge is the strongest bit of this movie. I think Phoebe Waller-Bridge definitely holds her own and kicks ass and has uh, a little bit of action in her own right that's uh-huh. independent of Harrison Ford's. Harrison Ford is hanging. He's you know, 142 years old. What are you going to do there? But he's still does what he can for his part, man. Um, CG is a little bit wonky in parts. Uh, there's characters you can completely remove, much like people say about Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's characters you can completely remove from this movie and it makes not a lick of difference in it. And I think that's where you've got to cut some of that time out. Ned Smiggleton as a villain just makes sense for this. Um, he's just good in everything. He's, I mean, he's just a good bad guy. Yeah. Uh, like that's, I mean, he's played plenty of like, like, good good loving roles but man he's just a delightful bad guy that's where he shines the most and he's kind of downplays the bad guyness here but but he's still he's cooking a little bit in this movie and it's, it's right. great to see the third act is a mess that's that's oh. the, the big deal here is the third act and how how Indy wants to end this story mm-hmm. does not sit right with me um, it doesn't make any sense when you look at what's come before and how much he loves history. The, the, the decisions and the choices that he wants to make at the end of the movie does not make sense for the character of Indiana Jones. I think that's what they got wrong in the writing process and the, excuse me, the story creation process. But outside of that, man, Antonio Banderas is there. I don't know why. I think he might have three lines. I, yeah, I saw him pop up in a poster and I was like, wait, really? Yeah. They, yeah. they haven't mentioned him at all, but they're just going to throw him in a poster. And there's a reason for it. They haven't mentioned him because he's got about six minutes in this movie. Is it because um, he has the Dial of Destiny and he's doing a radio show? <laughs> and, uh... We will turn to 74.5 FM. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me you wouldn't tune into that show, whatever he's doing. He's got a great voice. Hell yeah, I turned into that show. Tune into it, if you <laughs> dare. Sorry. Uh, poor Thomas Cressman, I think, is just destined to play a Nazi every time I see him on screen. But he plays a damn good one. But overall, yeah, that movie is way too long, but still uh, fun and a better send off for this character than Crystal Skull was. Let me put it that way. Okay. And uh, lastly, I watch The Flash, which is a movie. Let's get to our topic for the day, Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Flash wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see if I can rewind time, see if you can get you to do that again. <laughs> uh, Flash is okay for what it is. I think it is a decent movie. It is, 
like most movies seems these days, it is not the end all be all. Like some people said it would be James Gunn, Tom Cruise. It is not the piece of shit that so many people on the internet claim it to be. And like most things, there it's somewhere the truth lies in the middle. I think it mm-hmm. is a decent enough movie. It has parts that work. It has themes that almost work. Mm-hmm. And then there's things that just completely, utterly fail altogether in the 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 production, the filming of the movie, and in the narrative thrusts of the movie. Um, without you know, trying to dodge around some spoilers, if you know the crux of the story, Barry wants to go back in time to save his mom. Mm-hmm. Um, he, the, the the circumstances we see that lead up to his mom's death and his dad's frame for it, it's it's a a simple oh I forgot to do this thing so character leaves to do this thing that's when the murder happens he figures oh if i go back in time and i do the thing my mom stays alive and of course that one change propagates all the shit that comes after it the end of the film when barry has learned i can't fuck with the past the whole thing of this movie is with all the power in the world some things are beyond your control you just have to let things play out yeah goes back to fix things changes something else for a better outcome in the future barry has learned nothing this entire (laughs) movie (laughs) and what we think this better outcome is isn't a better outcome because he didn't learn a fucking lesson and that's what bothers me the most i think is he learns no lessons in this movie uh the, the change works for him personally at the end of the film but uh it also shows that he he nothing nothing was learned i have a question that you can answer it's not a spoiler mm. because if everything from the moment of his mother's murder forward is changed how does batman become michael keaton who is older than ben affleck what I've been trying to figure that out for days, Douglas. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> See, I'd have no problem. I'd have no problem if it was like Flashpoint, where him trying to change one thing ends up like killing Bruce Wayne, and it's Thomas Wayne as Batman. Like, mm-hmm. I forget how that went down, but yeah, that's exactly anyway. How it goes down. Yeah, it's Bruce that dies instead of Thomas. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, I forget what the Flash does that somehow gets that to change as well um but at least that makes sense in terms of you know you change this thing over here everything forward would would make sense you know butterfly wings etc but but how does it change the past anyway so no answer no answer. okay yeah. I'm cool. uh i mean it's good seeing jeremy irons as Af- alfred for a scene i don't know why jamie lannister was in this movie but he was there for a second uh the, the the breakout of this whole thing is Sasha Kaye. And I'll be all, I walked out and said, I want more of her as a superwoman or supergirl. I can never remember. Supergirl. supergirl. Yes, I want her as supergirl. And she's in talks. Keep her around. Uh, she's in talks. We'll see if that plays out, considering what we now know of the three different endings they want. And uh, the one that James Gunn decided to go with does not leave her much room for maneuvering. But yeah, it's... Uh, not true. Not true in the slightest. How so? Zack Snyder. In Man <laughs> of Steel, uh-huh. your favorite movie. I love that movie, man. You do. I uh, believe uh, boom, boom. He, when you go into, when Cal goes into the ship, mm-hmm. there is a pod that's open. The others, they have skeletons in them. But there's a pod that's open. He has said that that's Kara. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, So she's somewhere we haven't seen her, which doesn't mean jack shit because no, 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 no. And I mean this seriously. The one problem about these connected movies is that people go, oh, they're connected. So why wasn't X involved in this big situation? At the same time, these things are following comic book rules. So if it's a Batman title, you're not necessarily going to see Superman show up. So we've had all of these big world ending things happening. We don't know what's going on with Kara, but it doesn't mean she still can't show up. Or in this case, 
because Flash did do something that, as you said, didn't learn his lesson, there could be a shift where she's still present. I really hope so. And I hope uh, knowing those decisions that Gunn has made decides to unfuck himself and keep her around for as long as possible, because that is severely underutilized is what she is. And Keaton does an all right job as well. Michael Shannon's on screen for three minutes and goes through the motions. Oh, that's the other big thing. I know they're talking about wonky third acts, man. Those are two bad third acts between Indiana Jones and the Flash. The third that we get with them fighting Zod, which of course you've seen in trailers and Zod is yeah. there, has nothing to do with Flash's story whatsoever. There is no motivation to get Flash back to his own time. There's no ticking bomb or anything like that. It's just something completely separate of what Flash's situation is. And that doesn't make any sense to me. And that's well, weird. but isn't isn't that just a reinterpretation of the uh amazonian atlantean feud that because of what barry did there was like no superman and no everything else so atlantis and the amazons are fighting and gonna destroy the world and so flash has to fix things so that this war never happens so isn't that kind of the same idea is that you except in this DC EU, it's Zod. Zod is your guy. You're not going to pit Arthur against Wonder Woman. First of all, you should have. That would have been a better movie. I, I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that part. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep the budget down and just bring back Zod. So, <laughs> like you bring him back Michael and he'll Shannon. feel like a bigger force because this is a Kryptonian, and he's got this equipment. He almost destroyed the world once. What's to stop him here? And as Folks may know, not much. So <laughs> uh, maybe I, it's just, it's still the that's the pieces. only thing I can see. That's yeah, a replacement. That... Again, I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know how it works. I'll I'll see it when it comes out on home video. Hey, okay, let's save it, it save Friday, it. and it's WB with a movie that hasn't hit. So I figure they'll make the announcement by a month. I saw something today. I'm not sure if it's right or not, but I saw something today. What did you see? Uh, I think they had a, a date of like August or something like that. Well, that would actually track. It'd be about two months. And yeah. mo some are doing home releases. I mean, shit, some stuff's hit streaming about 30 months out. Fast X was like three fucking weeks. It really was. So whatever's happening with Universal, they're like turning it out. Whereas Super Mario Brothers, which is also Universal, uh, was like months later. But anyway, that's a whole other and conversation. We, we but WB has been sort of rushing things when they haven't hit as they expected. They've been rushing things to home video. So I uh, figure I'll see. It then. There you go. There you go. I say it for November. All right. Let's get into what our topic is. Um, Although this, this has been fun. This has been fun. This has been fun. This this prompt came to me when I was talking to somebody dream. on a Twitter a couple of weeks ago. And then he fell off his toilet and hit his head in the air. <laughs> and I drew with the this. flux capacitor. <laughs> um, the flux capacitor. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about movies, and and someone was talking about not picking up something on Blu-ray mm -hmm. because it really wasn't worth it anymore. For 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 from what we used to get, it wasn't really worth it anymore. Things were things were a little bit iffy. And I started thinking about it and I wholeheartedly agree with this person that what we used to get with bonus content in addition to the movie itself. Um this isn't the same these days. And that's why like I treasure some bits of of my physical media. And that got me thinking of what are my favorite bits of physical media, which is the topic for today. Some of our favorite pieces of physical media in my case mine are all movies box sets in two of the two of the three cases but uh did you want to go ahead and kick us off on what your favorite piece of physical media is sir well as i remember you had a had us break this down into one we love mm -hmm. one with a great commentary track and mm -hmm. one with great special features mm -hmm. so um i had it in my head about box sets but then i was like no he doesn't didn't say box sets so maybe i won't do that because if I did box sets, then we're talking like my 007 set and a few other things like that. Because uh, that's decades of cinema history where you can literally watch not only a different actor, but you can watch cinema change the way that they make movies across those films. Sounds like a viable option to me. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I decided instead because, you know, we're making a case for why physical media is still valuable these days. So I went with this one as my first. And you can see this. Other people can't. And that's this what, is what my Bell for 4K set from Shout Factory. Okay. And Shout Factory has really stepped things up with some of their physical releases. Mm-hmm. In concert with uh, Cartoon Saloon, they they put together a really solid physical release of the Irish trilogy, mm-hmm. uh, Wolf Walkers and um, the other two whose names, of course, I can't remember at the moment. Oh. But Shout Factory has some really great packaging. And this one in particular, it's the 4K set. Look at this. Look at this beautiful artwork. Which oh, represents wow. the inside of the digital space. You don't get shit like this a whole lot. No. And of course, it's no. got the feature film on blue on Blu-ray, bonus features on Blu-ray, and and the 4K edition comes with art cards. It comes with a book that has art and essays. Like this is i've got a poster i'm not i still haven't put it up because i kind of don't want to because it's pretty (laughs) but i mean there are it's kind of surprising because in the in the home release space you've got people like criterion that a lot of people know but i mean even vinegar syndrome put out this gorgeous gorgeous uh roadhouse and beastmaster box set i those were on the block of like wanting to show those off but something like this with Bell, this is one of the favorite pieces that I have here, just because of the exploration into the film, the quality of the film, the quality of the home release itself, as well as the packaging. Like, listen, that's fucking solid. <laughs> I've got I've got a four disc set of Indiana Jones, 4Ks, and they're in a digi thing like it's gonna fucking fall apart it's Mm. not very strong at all whereas this is one movie and that's the case it's in so it's beautiful it's wonderful it captures the spirit of the film it captures and celebrates the beauty of it that's why i picked it as the one that i love all right i can get down with that sir i can get down with that uh the one that i love no, I'm not going to dig it out. It's it's a foot and a half away, but it's behind a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, it is a box set, and it is the box set of Criterion's Wong Kar Wai collection. Um, you were talking about, I'm not sure you've seen it online. Uh, for those who who aren't familiar with a director Wong Kar Wai or with the box set, is a a very influential Chinese director. Um, really great at creating stories about. Uh, relationships between people that's kind of kind of his forte um and criterion thought to release last year or the year before a box set of six of his more well-known films i guess you could say um in the mood for love which i have talked about at length on this great uh, film oh yes it is on this year program uh the the erstwhile sequel 2046 because i almost always say 2049 when that is not the case 2046 as well as uh chunking express tears go by uh, days of being wild fallen angels happy together uh the when i bought this set i had only seen in the mood for love and that was good enough that i bought the entire thing on faith and i have since watched uh chunking express as tears go by uh and happy together and I only have uh, 2046 and and Days of Being Wild left. Uh, and they are all just amazing. I love it because it is a great curation of an esteemed filmmaker's work in one location. The box uh, captures the essence of a Wong Kar Wai film. Like it has its, he's known for making some of his movies in a more dreamy type of nature. Um, a lot of soft focus on things. And that's kind of what the box set looks like. Um, and it is one of those like thin cardboard type joints, but because it folds in, folds in, folds in, it's sturdy and compact. I've had yeah. no issues with it in my handling. So it was just a great collection of one man's filmography that I've been thoroughly enjoying as I've been watching. And it's uh, it's just great. It's just great. Uh, it is 
pricier if you look at it, if you get it from a criterion it's 160 bucks i got it during one of the Wait sales for the sale. <laughs> <laughs> yep i got it during one of the sales uh i can't remember how much i paid for it but uh but yeah i, I did all right with that one so that is the one that i love right on that's a that's a good call good call yes, I, there's there's quite a few films of his that i have not seen and i watched in the mood for love as a challenge from you mm-hmm and oh hey so amazon's got it for 116 people right on right on so the next one was great commentary track right yes and this one was hard because especially now i do a lot of home release reviews and i check out the bonus features mm-hmm. commentary tracks are a lot less common now than they used to be which is a shame and in particular with marvel movies that are they're a rarity so it's been nice to see sort of a shift i would have loved to have had a commentary track with creed 3 particularly because it was michael jordan b jordan's first movie wasn't one i would have loved that and there wasn't one uh one that uh frustrated the shit out of me if only because it just exemplified why the movie itself frustrated the shit out of me but listening to todd phillips talk about joker and all the shit that they were like, yeah, we just did a thing. And now it's in the movie. And who the fuck knows what it means? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you for proving my point. But <laughs> um, and then I almost went with Ocean's Eleven because that is so much fun to listen to. But I decided to cheat instead because, Daryl, you've taught me that cheating when making lists is OK, as long as it's in the spirit of the thing that we're doing. I'm wondering if your cheat is my cheat. No, it is not. Okay. <laughs> I can uh, almost guarantee it. it's not. Uh, because what I'm about to use is not a commentary track. That's uh, a cheat. Is, that's why it's a cheat. Uh, <laughs> Masaki uses Inuo, which mm-hmm. came out in 2021, got a wide release last year. It's a fucking amazing movie. It's an animated film that tells a story about a young boy who ends up sort of going on this adventure to try and get revenge for the death of his father and making him blind. But then he ends up falling in with this kid Inuo who's got like a hand coming out of his head and the other arm super long. And they start singing songs together and telling stories. And as they sing Inuo's body changes and becomes more regular looking. And the songs themselves uh, blend genres of of the period in which this film takes place, but also of the current. So like there's a track that's maybe 12 to 16 minutes towards the end of it. That's that is kind of like a queen song. It's so fucking beautiful, too. But. This movie does this home release from Shout Factory, another Shout Factory, does not have a commentary track. However, it has a significant interview with the director. And in that director, he answers so many questions and explains so many different things about the construction of the film that I watched that. And I was like, well, fuck, I missed all of that. <laughs> now I have to watch this movie again. And it really helped answer some questions that for me, not being of that culture, would just intrinsically know growing up in it, hearing these stories regularly. And it also helped reposition how I saw the relationship between the characters and recognizing what was happening with the titular Inuo. So having that sort of, not sort of, having that firsthand knowledge really helped to better understand the material to better explore it. So I highly recommend if you check out Inuo, after you watch it, go watch the the interview. It was absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. Oh, there you go. There you go. So, not your cheat. The cheat, but an acceptable cheat. Uh, mine, my cheat is the Kevin Smith films as one, the view askew films. Uh, these, oh, you're doing all of them? The yeah, view universe? They make for the best commentaries. He's got commentary <laughs> tracks on all of his movies. It's usually him. Of course, you'll find Muse there. Mosher, his Uber producer. For the mm-hmm. early ones, Affleck on Chasing Amy, Walt Flanagan there on Mall Rats, I think. Uh, Walt Flanagan is dog. Faster than Walt Flanagan's dog. Uh, you know, <laughs> O'Halloran and uh, Jeff Anderson popping up in there. It's it's it is the best way 
to do a commentary, I think. You get insights from the director and writer in this case, as well as the cast of the movie. Um, and they're just fun. It's a good mix of informative and fun. Ken Smith is like, here's my thought process when I was writing it, versus here's my thought process as well. I was shooting it, here's, and he's a man who has openly criticized himself for years of here's, you know, this scene didn't work how I wanted this scene to work. And he, he talks openly about his insecurities as a director, his pitfalls, and he, he occasionally celebrates his successes. Uh, and it's also just interesting if you watch the movies with commentaries in the order they came out uh on the flip side of the fun because he's always there you can also see the slow digression of jason muse as well because he's like he was fucked up on beer the clerks ah. and he's fucked up on beer in the commentary and by the time you get to like Right about chasing Amy J and Bob time, he's transitioned to cocaine and he's mm. almost incomprehensible on those commentary tracks. Uh, so yeah, it's it's weird to see from that perspective as well. Uh, but overall, just fun and funny and sometimes more entertaining than the movies themselves, just because of who he's assembled and how he runs his ship during the commentaries. Uh, I would say runner up being Fellowship of the Ring because the hobbits are just a goddamn mess on that commentary track and you see that they did not put all four of them together for the rest of the commentary tracks <laughs> on two towers of the king because all it did was fuck off for three hours uh, on that but i've read interviews of those dudes like people screenshot like snippets or something else and i've read a ton of that cruise interviews and the way that they just fuck with each other the entire time yeah uh, yeah. Particularly with uh, Orlando Bloom and the time he broke his rib. Oh, oh, did he break it? Oh, he did, he never mentioned it. <laughs> Apparently, he would just bitch constantly. Uh, Fucking Vigo was even giving him shit. Oh, did he? Oh, I heard he. Oh, yeah, yeah. Heard? he was, oh, he was yeah. in a little bit of pain, I think. Um, <laughs> Vigo fucking broke his foot. Broke his toe. Yeah, I I don't like commentaries where they are all recorded separately and they kind of edit them together. But in the Fellowship of the Ring case, it's. The four hobbits and then it's ian mckellen and then it's vigo mortensen and then it's Orlando Bloom. but they do a really good job blending them in but yeah for my pick is the kevin smith films for their great commentaries although oceans 11 is a good one uh yeah uh, I, I have to i have to say i there's so many reasons to to wish for um harvey weinstein to die mm -hmm. so many reasons uh within i'd say top 10 to 20 reasons has got to be if he dies, maybe Kevin Smith can get the rights to Dogma back, and maybe we can get a Blu-ray. Uh, yeah. I still have my DVD. I've got the special edition DVD. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting rid of that shit. Yeah, yeah, I'm never getting rid of that because I don't think we're ever getting a, uh, a Dogma Blu-ray. Um, and that's but one if of he the dies. Then it'll go to the estate, and maybe someone at the estate can make a deal. There you go. I think because he's offered. Only time he's ever spoken ill. Of, uh, of somebody that he worked with before Bruce Willis. The only time Kevin Smith really spoke ill of somebody. I, I can't remember if it's Claire Forlani in Mallrats or if it's Fiorentino in Dogma on that commentary, but it's one of two. And as a side note, it I watched a movie recently within the last four days that was it a criterion? was a criterion something you know what I helps watched... me using the letterbox to log the movies i watch uh, <laughs> this episode oh, not oh, brought to you by letterbox the leopard it was the leopard uh, uh an italian drama burt lancaster alain delone from les samurai um i was going through the audio to see if there was any kind of commentary track they had an audio track that described everything that was happening on scene on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So descriptive were, audio. The descriptive audio. But included in that, it was also the person was also describing the narrative themes and what was going on inside characters' heads as yeah. well. And I thought that was a completely different way to experience a movie. Yeah. That was uh, pretty fucking wild. But what is your third movie there, sir? Uh my third one is uh if i remember correctly the call with special features what special features uh would we count as among our favorites if not our favorite and i went with one that is another recent one this one is not released by shout factory but in 
particular with the bonus features that I've watched over the last couple of years, I look for something that, particularly if it's a film I enjoy, how does it explore it? What do we learn from it? Is it time well spent? Whether it's two minutes, five minutes, 15, 20, whatever. Uh, because, for example, you look at Black Adam, they clearly, with those bonus features, thought that they were on to something. And I feel horrible watching them because you've got this, like, big budget presentation with members of the cast doing introductions like this major television production of taking you behind the scenes on stuff. Mm -hmm. And then of course, black Adam goes nowhere. And then you get something like my choice, Isla Nyshear's nobody. Uh, the Odenkirk this movie fucking rules. Yeah. Who would have thought Bob Odenkirk would make for a fucking badass. <laughs> and maybe it's because I've been watching so much Golden Harvest and Fortune Star movies this year. Like, I've been doing a whole lot of Hong Kong cinema, so I've been watching my action movies in a different way. Mm -hmm. And what was really wonderful with the bonus features on Nobody is taking you through how they did literally everything how yeah. they tried to make everything as practical as possible how they created the stunts how they made them around bob how they taught bob how to level up a little bit from there everything about it and of course um you two share the same last name so i had to i had to pick it just it popped in my head because i'll never forget finally someone says my last name right <laughs> <laughs> i've never forgotten you saying that and so but i was going through and i'm I'm looking at the list of the movies that i've loved over the last couple of years and i was like maybe it's because um what's his name because he trained him and he's also in this i'm looking at the the cast list and he's not even in letterboxd one of the main ones bernhardt the rizza no, not, not Marissa. <laughs> um, but there's a guy who is in Extraction 2 that as soon as the song was like, oh, it's that fucking dude. He's going to have a great fucking death. And let's put it this way. It ain't a great death, but it means something. Okay. And that's that you for for a trainer, for a stunt person, whatever. If you're giving someone some shine, let it be a good death. And it was. Uh, as soon as it happened, I was like, yes. All right. But but he's he's the guy on the bus who like, I'm sorry, man, it's it's. I'm sorry, I couldn't protect your stupid brother. But mm -hmm. that guy, but he he's trained Odenkirk and really takes you through everything. But these bonus features are just phenomenal. So if you haven't checked out Nobody One, it's just a great solid action comedy that has some weight to it. It's got some surprises to it. But those bonus features are fucking great. Right on. Right on. Um, my third one is another cheat. <laughs> a cheat because it's something that I know exists. I just don't. Episode eighty-eight it. favorite cheats. <laughs> favorite cheats. Uh, Cheech cheese steak off of Independence Boulevard. By the way, is the best cheese steak in all of Charlotte. I'm just plug. We are now sponsored by Cheech cheese steak. By the way. Uh, <laughs> I had one of those two weeks ago. It was phenomenal. I was asleep 10 minutes later. Uh, no, my uh, my one. Why is... were you driving? Why were you driving? <laughs> those poor people. Uh, it is the Star Wars Skywalker Saga box set. It is 27 discs with 26 hours of bonus features on it. Um, and the giant nice thick size booklet i i'm intimidated by this thing you One, said I have thick size right thick. you put an accent on it so i was like excuse me <laughs> uh i'm intimidated by this whole thing but on a lesser extent just the the very first star wars on dvd that came out in 04 the star wars trilogy mm -hmm. that by itself has a slew of great special features including my favorite making of documentary of all time in the making of Star Wars. And in, they, they, they they go through the whole trilogy, but 75% of the joint is spent on Star Wars. And they touch a little bit on Empire, they touch a little bit on Jedi. Uh, but yeah, just specifically for that making of featurette, you know, when I talk about the special features, man, that really does it for me. And, and just talking to the sound engineers over here and the production guys over there, and, you know, all the shit that Lucas had to encounter and his actors are giving him shit and nobody in the crew trusts him and all that kind of good stuff. Um, 
you know, and, and it also includes the old school trailers for it. So it's kind of interesting to see how they cut trailers back in the 70s and 80s versus how they cut trailers now. You know, we don't have the voice guy anymore, unfortunately. Uh, there's no in a world. world. Yeah, none of that good stuff happening. What a great fucking movie that is, by the way. If you guys haven't seen that, it, I'm pretty sure it's called In a World. In a World. And yeah. it's so good. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, all sorts of good shit in there. But if, if you want to pony at the dough and you have room somewhere on your mantelpiece for the uh, the 27 discs of Star Wars, go ahead, go on ahead and do that. Uh, my question to you before we get to our challenges, sir, if you could only choose one special feature, what are you going with? I'll give you three choices. You get a director's commentary. You get, uh, we'll say, a 45-minute making of featurette or a gag reel. Which of those three are you going with? Okay. Gag reel? What, was, what were the options again? Gag reel? Director's commentary or a 45 minute long making of featurette. 45 minute long making featurette because, because if it's done well, you sort of get all of it because they'll show you the making of the movie. They'll show you, they'll talk to you about how they did different things. They will show you some of the mess ups. There is, I want to say it's about five minutes. I watched it a week or two ago. Uh, Sakura, the Donnie Yen co-directed and lead acting action movie that that hit home media a week or two ago. Um, Heard about it's it. maybe a five minute making of featurette, but you hear a little bit from the cast. You get to see how they shot stuff. You see Donnie in costume doing a scene and then being like, no, 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 we got to do this again. You see him dressed down, just directing. You get all of these different things. So you get a really wonderful mixture, and particularly if it's 45 minutes, they're going to have time to get into stuff. Nothing mm -hmm. frustrates me more than, and I had this experience this year with Babylon, that is a movie of high technical everything. Yeah. And you could do 45 minutes on the music. You could do 45 minutes on the costumes, all these different things. And I want to say uh, it was like two to three minute featurettes, and there was like three of them. What the fuck? Right. <laughs> um, so I would love my choice would be 45, a 45 minute making up. Yeah. yeah what about you? I also live between that or I'm, I'm just a sucker for a good director's commentary. If it is an entertaining director, there's some directors that are just like, yeah, that was a difficult shoot. And then you don't hear anything for five more minutes. <laughs> and then there's some that starts off. You're like, oh, this is going to be right. Die Hard kind of starts off rough. But then, like, once it gets rolled in material and kind of really gets into it, and he's like, oh, I remember on this day, this wasn't working, and we did this, and then we just whipped this up on the day of, five minutes before we shot it. I love a good director's commentary that gives you the insight into the background of what was happening at the time they were shooting. That is wonderful. That's one of the things I love about these commentary tracks, because you can find out stuff like that. Whereas, and this was really amusing, I literally sat down and was like, well, okay then. Uh, so Radiance Films is a relatively new boutique physical media distributor. For those of you that aren't familiar with them, the, the individual that runs it had been with Arrow and decided to go do his own thing. Today, no, no. The 20th of June in the U.S., a film called Red Sun. It's a German movie from 1970. It is directed by Rudolf Thom. Uh, first time Blu-ray release period, UK, US. In the director's, for the director's commentary, you can actually pick a dip, a scene or a section of the movie to start in and you can jump back and forth wherever you want. Like literally, they've got a whole thing instead of just turn on commentary and then pick your scene. Yeah. So I go to the end of the movie because there's something that happens that I'm like, what's going on here? So I want to hear from it. Yeah, it's mostly silence. Oh yeah, that was improvised. And it's like, well, I mean, that's cool to know that that was improvised. But like, let's talk about it. It's the end of the like. Come on, help me out. And there's just nothing. So it, I, I literally was like, well, uh, 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 special shout right. out, special shout out to Ryan Johnson releasing a commentary for a movie still in theaters, like he did with Knives Out. And Glass Onion. And, and oh, that's right. He did do it for Glass Onion as well. Uh, for those wondering, that uh, Star Wars joint is on Amazon for uh, region-free Blu-ray for... 68. 
13 percent off 65 bucks right now man so there you go or if you scroll down just a little bit lower if you did the same search that i did in 4k it's 329 dollars or 221 yeah i'm looking at that right now like oh boy that's rough i think i can stick with the blu-rays on that one uh, uh, yeah. that's why i'm fine with my blu-ray copies uh i am uh notorious on not wanting blu-rays for older films i already have blu-rays for seven eight nine so i feel like that might be a little bit redundant on my part but uh still interested in maybe one day checking this out but let's get into our challenges sir Whew. you gave me a good one thank you thank you I, for i've already forgotten what i've given you sir oh this is why i write everything down yeah so i don't forget yeah i, I don't write way. it down because you better watch it not me that's not my homework <laughs> you <laughs> you write write down my yours homework. too uh what the I write it all down i'm taking notes as we speak in fact, uh, I'm actually recording this conversation so that if I forget anything, I can play it back. No? Okay. Uh, so I I hadn't been able to see it. You apparently uh, traveled to Texas just to watch this movie with some friends. I thought that was an interesting choice. You've got local friends too, but, you know, go see it with some friends. That's right. Maybe you, maybe you were asked, hey, I dare you to come out and do this. And you rolled a D1 and you were like, fuck, I got to go now. I don't know how things work. I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, but I have watched Honor Among Thieves. And this movie had no business being as much fun as it is. Mm -hmm. I really didn't expect it to. I thought it was going to be jokey, jokey, jokey. I thought it was going to be leaning into the wildness of it all. And I should not, should not have been surprised. This was written and directed by John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, who did Game Night, which fucking rules. I still don't know how Frito-Lay could possibly make any money off the deals that they put out, but <laughs> we're still investigating it. Is we it will Jesse Clemens? Is he the one who says that? Yes, he is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Does not show up in Honor Among Thieves, though, but there's always, always hope for a sequel, which I hope comes... Because what's great about this movie is it's it's really more of a character story that just so happens to involve magic and it is silly and it is wonderful and it's exciting and it's got a chunky dragon and who doesn't love a good chunky dragon. But all of the stuff that you see in the trailers is nothing like what the movie is. And that is perhaps its best quality is that there are plenty of uh, surprises to be had and the villain in it. It's just a fucking villain. They're just there's no like, oh, but they had a good point. Nope. You know? Nope. Um, Return to the grimy villains. That's what we need to do. I'm I Crystal and I are two episodes away from finishing this anime Food Wars, and the bad guy of the fourth season shows up in the previous episode because one of the quote unquote bad guys of this season is the that bad guy's wife. And it's like, oh, that's why he was doing the stuff that he was doing as an as an asshole in the previous season, because he was trying to to save his former wife. Oh, oh, okay. I just thought he was a dick bag. That's kind of <laughs> interesting. But in this case, no, just just evil people doing evil shit trying to steal your soul. I love Sweet. it. Sweet. I love it. And you have a good time with it. And honestly, and I wrote this in my review. I can't remember the last time I was watching something and went. I want them to be a sequel of this. I haven't finished this adventure. I want there to be a sequel. So uh, hoping, fingers crossed, that we get one. Oh, that's absolutely going to happen, I think. Absolutely going to happen. I I love it. It's it's goofy without campy. Or maybe campy without goofy. I'm not sure which one I mean. Like, there's plenty of silly moments in here. Yeah, but it, it fits within the world that they've created for this. It's not yes. like, huh? This is all kind of silly, isn't it? From the outside, it's not that. It's yeah. the silliness within the the narrative structure that they've built, which they didn't take low blows at the fans of Dungeons and Dragons. Not even a little. They, they respected they, the material. Yeah, they very much respected the material, and they used the best that they could. They they used the strengths of the cast, and one of the things with Chris Pine, for example, I love how he more or less doesn't really take himself so seriously with a lot of these roles. Mm. And it isn't, doesn't mean that he doesn't take the characters or the performance seriously, but he's willing to take the piss out of himself. He and Chris Helmsworth are very good at that. I mean, they're related. So that makes sense. (laughs) It's last name to make you Kelvin, Kelvin, Kelvin timeline. Yeah. Kelvin timeline reference. Father and son, father and son. (laughs) son. 
But like the the hologram sequence with him as the bard is so fucking great. And watching the bonus features and seeing him do the different versions of that and just breaking because he's not quite doing it right or it's just too fucking funny. Uh, it just it's it's great. So it's a it's a great cast. It's a great ensemble. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez gets to do some fun stuff in there. It is a lot of fun. And the best thing they didn't do, uh, Re- Rene Jean Page. I thought he was going to be in so much of the movie, and nope, he went and there the perfect amount. Yep. They were the in, perfect and amount, out. and then fucking gone. And my favorite little piece of information before we go to your film, which I am dying to find out what you thought, is that in the scene where he leaves the group, he they're on a beach, and he is just walking. Mm-hmm. And he keeps going. And Chris Pine makes some comment like, so I guess he's just going to keep walking? Like, where's he going? <laughs> That whatever line it was was an ad lib because Rene didn't hear he was so far off he didn't hear the director cut. cut so he just kept walking so Chris Pine played into it. <laughs> I love that so, shit. So silly, man. So silly. But this this is what I'm talking about. This is what is so great. If you just watch movies, that's awesome. Enjoy them. But when you get the opportunity to go through these bonus features and see how the sausage is made, and actually get a get a sense of what they were doing. It's you you get a different appreciation and a depth and understanding of what they were doing. It's also why, again, unfortunately, the flip side of that is you'll watch something else and go, that doesn't make sense within the context of this world. John Wick, chapter four, Crazy driving talk. a cannon fodder car. That's Crazy some bullshit. Talk. Crazy talk. Um, okay. uh, you were almost there to making a good point. My movie. <laughs> <They're>... Close. <laughs> Close. Almost. God. I always, I always lose the thread at the end. So yours, <laughs> You sir. gave me the out. Oh, excuse me, sorry. The Outlaws, uh, I did. directed by Kang Young Soon. It's got our boy. Uh, also, Americans know him as Don Lee. I do believe our, our big beefy Asian from Eternals <laughs> is how I would say a good amount of people know him uh, that are listening to this podcast currently. That's probably oh, or I trained a Busan, which is also a. Uh, it, it was that was once. my introduction successfully crossed the borders over to Americans as well. Forget that. Uh, did that American remake ever come out? Uh, no, I think they're still working on it. Oh boy, working on it for about three years. All right, yeah. Um, Outlaws. It's it's a uh, it's like it's kind of a old school classic cops and robbers story, man. Mm-hmm. You got your police on one side. You got you know them working to beat on their on the criminals on the other side, and then three. This is all Korean. And then three Chinese criminals show up and completely upset the ecosystem that exists between cops and criminals uh, in an attempt to muscle in and take over new territories. And it all becomes, you know, the cops got a job to do. We got to stop these guys. But because these three guys are are completely disrupting the criminal element, the criminals are starting to team up with the cops so they can take these three guys down. Um, so it's a, a an uneasy partnership between them all in order to get these three off the board, and it is hilarious in some parts. There's so much humor throughout this. Uh, within about the, the the halfway three quarters, way all the humor is gone, and it gets quite serious after that, uh, with a, a little bit of humor here and there in between. But it it's it is a good movie. It is a damn fun, fine movie. Um, I think that Don Lee is amazing comedically like he's got big guy he, he's got his timing comedically but he's also just big and imposing so he can move and suck and jive during those action scenes as well uh his whole little element of of his police task force they're all great these three criminals are properly intimidating like you you have a good healthy fear of these guys as you should and then you have like the local gangsters in the middle, like, all right, yeah, you guys are gangsters and criminals. You guys are nothing compared to this new threat coming in there. Uh, it's it is a great movie. Two hours, quick pace, man. I enjoyed it from beginning to end. There's a lot of great shit in there. I would recommend this to the peoples, man. If you're willing to read subtitles, uh, do the damn. Stream it on Tubi. Stream it on Tubi, man. On Tubi. For free, ninety nine. So go ahead and get that under your belt. Uh, it's and it's got, you know, they call it an I think letterbox has it as action and crime most of your action is in the back half of this movie yeah a lot of setup to what's going on to get to the action but none of that setup is boring because that action is replaced by that's where all the comedy is as well Mm -hmm. and then you get that change somewhere about the halfway three quarters mark i was a big fan 
uh, then I'm delighted to tell you, if you didn't know, and if our listeners didn't know, there's a sequel called The Roundup that came out uh, a year ago, I think. And this year, uh, The Roundup No Way Out came out. So that's your third film in the series. I believe it's The Crime City is the overall title of these films. And they have already shot a fourth film. Well, damn, apparently this is going to be uh, this is Don Lee's franchise. Uh, you you released a review of No Way Out on Elements of Madness. I did. If my memory serves. Yes, I did. I, 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 I have I've been lucky enough to review the roundup last year, which is why I saw the outlaws. I was like, well, I guess I should see it. They're, they're connected in the same way that like the lethal weapon stories are connected, which yeah. is to say not at all. They just yeah. have recurring characters. Uh, so you could watch the roundup without having seen the outlaws, but I was like, come on, I need to see Don Lee do his thing. Mm-hmm. You need to see and, where Don Lee starts to see how where he's at now. Oh, that's so fucking good. One of the great things is the introduction of of Detective Ma that he plays. He is walking through a crowd where these two dudes are having a fight outside of like a convenience store, and he's on the phone. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm running late. Ho- hold on a second. He just walks up behind a dude, takes a knife. What the fuck are you doing with this slap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Between I started watching a uh, Warrior, which is a show on HBO about uh, Chinese immigrants coming to so good San Francisco post Civil War. Um, so you know the Western expansion, the mm-hmm. kind of uh, a little bit after the era of cowboys and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and the and the the, the criminal Chinese element that uh, that has been established here in chinatown in san francisco so between seeing that and then watching the outlaws i have seen more men stabbed and hacked to death in the last week than I have, and slapped than i've ever seen before and i love it well two things one is what's great about the roundup and the roundup no way out is that it continues the trend of introducing detective ma in a very similar situation of he's on the way somewhere and just runs into some bullshit and he's he's always so exasperated like can we please not just do this come on (laughs) and he always ends it by telling some detective i wasn't here like whatever police officer (laughs) i wasn't here i wasn't involved but the other side is is if you haven't watched warriors i haven't finished season two joe taslam is in that sub zero uh, the the lead actor in whose name I've forgotten, Andrew Koji, Bullet Train. I was about to say is in Bullet Train. They have like when we talk about martial artists, they have actual dudes, guys and girls, just fucking whooping ass mm-hmm. everywhere. And it's a really wonderful story that talks about a part of American history. It's fictionalized, but talks about American history in a way that a lot of people don't realize is actually pretty fucking accurate. Uh, in the way that Asian immigrants came to this country, were promised citizenship, and then were absolutely properly fucked yeah. once their job was done with the railroad and other things. And where the whole immigrants are coming to take your jobs. There's a whole storyline in season one about that with the with the Irish, the Irish. who themselves at prior to the Chinese and the Koreans coming in were the immigrants trying to steal your jobs. But that's a whole other fucking story nobody wants to talk about. But but Warriors has great action and a really interesting storyline running through it. I still need to finish season two. There you, go. you can do so just in time for season three, which hits on the 29th, I do believe. So that is it for this episode of the Sound Marathon. Unless you have something else, Doug, to wrap this up. Uh, I, I, I've got some other thoughts on John Wick 4, but I'm probably wrong, so I just keep them to myself. For the best. All right, then, that is it. <laughs> for this episode, for episode 87. We'll be back, uh, I do believe, uh, sometime, see if we can get one knocked out before Douglas takes himself a nicely earned vacay. To, uh, and even if we don't, it'll still be waiting for you. Uh, talk about our favorite movies of the year thus far, since we are approaching the halfway mark of the year in our Davidson 2023. We'll get that all figured out as it goes, man. But for now, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Until then, you all take it easy and have a good one.